first of all, thank you, William, for the introduction. Also, thank you, William, for being me a month ago. Um, now, just, just get me. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, in those of you who are further away, do not be afraid to come nearer if you want a better view of my pictures. See how you are where you're sitting, but don't be afraid to come nearer. Um, as several of you will know, the College has been devoting much attention recently to what we're calling our Univ North project, which is the expansion of our property up in North Oxford. And so it was suggested to me by William and others that I might think about some important land purchases in the College and give you a chance to take a longer view of our approach to, acquire, to acquiring land. Well, I suppose as Univ's archivist, I can take a longer view of things than probably anybody else in this room. And if there's an overarching theme to my talk, it would be that we didn't have to end up with a college situated on the south side of the high and an annex in Staverton Road. Now, you're not going to get exercised so much in counterfactual history. What you'll get is that there are moments in our history when our predecessors were faced with a major fork in the road, as it were, about which way they should take the college. And we need to think about the contexts for their choosing one direction rather than another, and the consequences of their decisions. So we agreed I would take you right back to the earliest days of Univ and tell you something about how we came to settle on our central site, how we began to acquire it, and then move forward quickly to the 1960s for the second part of my talk and tell you something about how we came to get Stavatonia. Along the way, I'll tell you some things about the development of the sites which we chose to inhabit. And then there should be time for a few questions before some very well-earned drinks before lunch. So, let's go back to the 1280s when our first fellows were appointed. I said I'd take the long view. We have to begin here with a site common to every single Ox college in Oxford. Where do you get your initial central site? The central medieval Oxford, unsurprisingly, was full of individual properties. And unless your founder was lucky enough to get a single great piece of land, as happened to Maudlin in the 1450s, or, as with the founders of St John's and Trinity in the 1550s, there is an unoccupied monastic site ready to grab, the only way for the college to take root was for its founder or founders to buy up a cluster of adjoining properties. Now, in fact, William of Wickham, who founded New College, did just that in the 1370s and 1380s, buying up a whole clutch of indi individual houses which created the space on which his college now stands. William was wealthy, but also lucky, in that Oxford was going through an economic depression at that time, so he got all the property he wanted in barely a couple of decades. As you will see, it took Univ rather longer. We think that Univ began life where Brasenose now stands. Now, this rather schematic site shows the site of where Brasenose is. So, where my finger is, that's Radcliffe Square. Um, now, you want to look at a little university hall and Brasenose Hall. Um, these were properties bought in the 1250s and 1260s from the by the University of Oxford with William of Durham's money. So this rather grotty little document from June 1253 is the deed by which Little University Hall was acquired for the university. In the 1280s, these properties were handed over to our first four fellows. And ever since the days of our first historian, William Smith, in the early 18th century, we've presumed, mainly because of its name, that the fellows occupied Little University Hall, but rented Brasenose Hall out. But Univ is not on the south side of Brasenose Lane. Brasenose College is. What happened? The answer is that in June 1332, we bought another property called Great University Hall. Now, to orientate you, here is our main point. This is our site here. And here is Great University Hall. This is the middle. Um, you're going to see these maps several times so you get too lost. We have the conveyance for Great University Hall. This is a beautiful object. But think about it. This piece of parchment, 685 years old, 
is the legal proof that we own the central third of the main quad out there. This document is composed in medieval Latin and written in a medieval hand, so I'm not going to test you on its contents. But those of you nearby, see if you can spot on the top of the line where being sold the land by Richard de Turquine and his wife Joan, William de Lafra and his wife Catherine, and Juliana Petitplace, and their seals are all on the bottom of the deed. My guess is that Joan, Catherine, and Juliana were all were three sisters who'd inherited this property and wanted to sell it. Mind you, one of the frustrating things for people who like their finances is we know so little about how much our early properties actually cost. Um, so this deed says nothing about how much we paid for Petty Place Sisters, say that it was um, yeah, yeah, Quandam Sumam Pecunia, a certain sum of money, the gene facts. This lack of detail is absolutely typical of our early conveyances. Well, we know that Great University Hall would become the nucleus of the central site of our college. But it didn't have to be so. In the 1330s, you know, owned properties in several bits of Oxford. We had two houses on the north side of the high. We had another house in Oriel Street. There was a property on New College Lane. And we had acquired 83 and 84 High Street right back in 1307. So it's quite a good portfolio of properties. You may well ask, why did we own all these properties in Oxford? The reason was they could be rented out to give us an annual income, and rents and properties were the only way in medieval times that one could get an income. In fact, it wasn't until the later 18th century that Univ, for the first time, began to invest in stocks and shares and draw an income from those sources. But you can see, once again, we had a choice where we could settle we didn't have to end up with our central site on the high. Indeed, if you go back to the middle decades of the 14th century, Unum appears to have been exploring various options for how to expand. Let's go back to Brasenose Hall again. And so, there's the University Hall and there's Brasenose Hall. Now, you'll notice a few other properties picked up. There's St. Thomas Hall, Shell Hall, Oliphant Hall, rather nice name, Hampton Hall and Sickle Hall. Those are all properties we're buying between the 1350s and the 1380s. It's quite a, a clutch, impressive clutch of acquisitions. And you can see we're making a determined effort to acquire properties all next door to each other. So are we still not sure where we're going to get? It's very frustrating. We have no evidence for the decision-making processes of our medieval forebears. If we go back to the 1350s, pretty well the only evidence we have for the life of Univ exists in title deeds. We have no extant accounts until the 1380s. We don't create a college register which records, however fragmentarily, decisions of the governing body until 1509. But I think we can assume that the master and fellows of the 1350s were keeping their options open. Nevertheless, some options were started to be closed off. In the 14th century, some other, newer colleges were coming into being, and two of them, Queen's and New College, actually bought houses from us in the 1340s and the 1380s to create their central site. Actually, I can tell you here that as well as Queen's and New College, portions of Lincoln, Oriel, Brasenose, Somerville and St Hughes are all built on properties once owned by us, which I think is a record unique in Oxford or Cambridge. Also, as well as expanding our Brasenose quarter, Unit was keeping an eye on developments of the South Street of the High. So here we are back at the High again. And so look, there's Great University Hall. Now, there's, look at, there's a place called Ludlow Hall, and there's a place called Rose Hall and Whitehall. We acquired all of those in 1336, so we're just getting a nice little clutch of properties building up. And here's the title deed by which we got Rose Hall and White Hall. They're very roughly where the Kitchen Block and the Mitchell Building now stand. And on this deed, no payment is mentioned. So what were the advantages of the High Street site? 
One good thing was there were lots of possibilities for extending east and north and west and south. The Brezno site is something of an island with slightly fewer opportunities. There was also a particular problem with the Brezno site. If we go back to it again, you may have noticed I've coloured in all the properties owned by us. There's this space here. This, is called, this was a house called Ivy Hall. It had been given to Studley Priory back in 1261, and the Priory rented it out to make money. We never owned Ivy Hall. I wonder, did we ever put out feelers to Studley Priory to say, look, would you like to sell it to us? And did Studley Priory say, nah, not interested? They could have rented it out to us, because we know in the 1420s and 1430s, the principal of Brazenose Hall yeah, is, up, is renting Ivy Hall from the Priory. But maybe we at Univ would like to own the property outright. And so I wonder if that's the crucial reason why we decided our future home would not be the site of now Brazenose. There were added attractions to taking up residence in Great University Hall. As its name suggests, it was a large building, larger than Little University Hall. So that even without the need to pay for any rebuilding work, the Master of Fellows could live there and rent out unused rooms to visiting scholars and make some more money. Now we don't know exactly when we made Great University Hall our base, but we were certainly renting out Little University Hall by 1368. So clearly we were on the high by then. And bit by bit, we duly relieved ourselves of all these properties here. So, let's go. Second Hall, Hampton Hall, and Oliphant Hall, they all get sold to Lincoln College in 1463. Oh, by the way, you'll see the wavy line at the top of the deed. Now, this is a bit of medieval security. Medieval deeds got written in pairs, both written on the same piece of parchment, and you cut them in half with a wavy line, so the two could match up perfectly as security. Now, Lincoln College has got its copy of the deed. And a few years ago, the archivist there and I said, well, come on, let's have a game. <laughs> so I took our deed over to Lincoln College, and the deeds, which have been apart for 550 years, match perfectly. <laughs> so medieval, medieval security does work. Meanwhile, the other places, Little University Hall, St Thomas Hall and Shelf Hall, they were all gradually consumed by Brasenose Hall in the late 15th century to create a single enormous complex. Then some benefactors decided to turn Brasenose Hall into a college, and we agreed in 1508 to sell all those properties to trustees on top of the, acting on behalf of the founders. And this is a rather magnificent deed, and you'll see signatures of all the trustees at the bottom, and all but one of their seals. This is a rather magnificent document. Now, my brief is talking about buying acquiring land, but it's hard to separate this from the question of, well, how do you want to develop the land you've acquired? So let's go back to Great University Hall. Now, you may have tweaked something here. I've sort of taken the story in part up to about the late 1300s. But UNIV has yet to build anything. We've just been occupying existing properties, like Great University Hall. We certainly carried out some conversion work. So in January 1370, we converted one room into a brand new chapel. But what might this place have looked like? Great University Hall is now deep under our main quad. I own up here, I want to get the archaeologists in here and dig, dig big holes in our main quad. It'll never happen. But here is a reconstruction of what a medieval Oxford hall might have looked like. So you have the high street facade, a little passageway coming out there, a garden, you see some big windows of a hall, and lots of rooms all around. Now, if you think of Great University Hall looking a bit like this. This is what our earliest fellows might have known as their home in the 1300s. Now, we're going back again to our map of the high. When our earliest accounts of the 1380s appear, they show here we are in Great University Hall, Rose Hall's been demolished, White Hall is part of the college, 
Ludlow Hall is being rented out as a separate building. In the 1390s, some fun starts. In 1390, Unif settled definitively a long and incredibly complex property dispute which had been rumbling along for 30 years, draining away our finances and our energies. It's like we got our confidence back. And there's a little entry in our accounts for the six months from November 1391 to June 1392. Now, this is pretty horrible handwriting, I will grant you. So trust me when I say you can read here, I can pro portationem antiquimuri inter disportum rostrum at disportum de Ludlow Hall sextinarium, which translated is item for carrying away of an old wall between our garden and the garden of Ludlow Hall six pets. I admit I have a geeky love of medieval accounts. So much can be discovered from tiny little things, and here is the case in point. The college has decided it's not going to lease out Ludlow Hall as a building, but will subsume it into its central site. This is a significant moment. At first, there are financial benefits. Now, think of that reconstructed hall I showed you. Imagine two of them side by side take the wall out. Now, all the rooms in both buildings can be rented out individually. And Ludlow Hall can therefore give us more money as a lot of rooms than as a single property. But there's something else. Also in the 1390s, UNIF began work on its first ever new building. This was our original chapel, completed, we think, in 1398. It was erected at the southern end of the gardens of Great University Hall in Ludlow, so we'd use the rest of the buildings to live in. And here it is, as drawn by the great antiquarian Anthony Wood just before his demolition in the 1660s. And it was sort of out there under the lawns. Over the next half century, a complete quadrangle gradually came into being around that chapel. And Great University Hall and Ludlow Hall, bit by bit, were demolished to make way for it. The college accounts show construction of new rooms in the 1430s. And from 1448 to 51, we built a hall, which actually stood underneath what's now staircases six and seven down that way. Then in 1458, we got a benefaction to build a tower on a house street frontage, which became the home of our masters. And so at last, we had a complete quadrangle. Here it is, as drawn by John Beerblock in 1566. It is a rather schematic drawing. If you look at the way the chapel is drawn compared to Anthony Wood, it's not a detail. But this is the only image of our medieval quad to exist. This is where the first part of my talk is going to start to fade out. Because what we see happening to Great University Hall and Ludlow Hall continues to happen with the rest of our central site. Let's go back to our map again. I'm fond of this map. And I've tried to show that if you can see all the properties we've gradually brought up. It's a long process. The final one is Deep Hall here, bought in 1773. And it doesn't quite stop because, of course, 90 High Street, bought in 1905, and 91 High Street, born in 1975. And here's Logic Lane. Well, we had 83 and 84 High Street, and gradually we buy up all the bits in the middle. And more recently, we've been buying properties on the north side of Merson Street. But to run this long process, we have to choose what we do with these nice buildings. Do we adapt them or demolish them? Now there is Little University Hall on the High Street. This is a really unhelpful name, isn't it? Because of the other University Hall. Well, this one, the master lodged here in 1531 until it and the cock of the hoop were demolished in 1716 to make way for a Radcliffe Quad. Meanwhile, right, Deep Hall, that's where the Shelley Memorial now stands. And Stanford Hall, that was replaced by the new building in the 1840s. And most obviously of all, in the 1630s, we got rid of our little, little medieval quadrangle and replaced it with something bigger, 
which is the main quad that we all know so well now. On the other hand, we've adapted Helen's Court and 1991 High Street, and of course, as of this year, we've just taken over 10 Merton Street and adapted it, so that we now have our wonderful new library and lecture room there. We can see all of this as a gradual and incremental process from the moment we demolished that wall between Great University Hall and Ludlow Hall in the early 1390s. So, it's time for part two now. We're going to travel northwards to the edge of Summerton and go and contemplate Stavatonia. Our starting point, perhaps, is the inauguration of the Goodhart Building in 1962 as the last substantial accommodation block to be built from scratch on the college's central site. After the Goodhart Building was opened, we had the housing stock to accommodate two years' worth of undergraduates on the site. But that was all. Our finalists and, under and postgraduates had to live in digs, and I'm sure that quite a few of you here must remember doing this. And we could offer pretty well no college accommodation to married students. Early in 1965, therefore, a Building and Development Committee was formed at UNIV to examine this question. Two strong options presented themselves, both based around UNIV's central ho existing housing stock. First of all, there was what became called the Banbury Road Triangle. Rather schematic facing it, but there's St Giles's Church, OK. There's the old Parsonage Hotel. Up here, is 14 to 36 Woodstock Road. We bought that in, the 19, in 1930. The old parsonage we'd acquired in 1361. And now these houses up here, these were built on some land allotted to the college after St Giles, the parish of St Giles was enclosed in the 1930s. Now this had the advantage that it was quite near the college, of course. We owned this great contiguous piece of land and had lots of existing houses which could be adapted. The other thing to do was to look northwards. Back in 1953, we had acquired 104 Woodstock Road on the corner of Woodstock Road and Sabaton Road. It cost us, um, how much? Yes, it cost us eight and a half thousand pounds, property prices. Okay. Now, in the middle of the 20th century, we were acquiring several houses in Oxford, especially in North Oxford. Our aim seems to be determined to flats, and a few of them were rented out to, to, to uni students and some to our younger fellows, but most of them were treated as commercial properties to be rented out with people with no college links, but it increased our income. And actually, one group of people who regularly rented houses from us were visiting academics staying in Oxford for a year or so. Now, there was quickly a strong college link at 104 Woodstock Road, because one of the flats which was created there was these to our former master, William Beveridge, and his wife, who occupied it until their respective deaths. Last November, I discovered some papers in the cellar of Nine Merton Street, which included some correspondence from the Beveridges about their tenants in Woodstock Road. Now, I don't know if any of you do this, but on our website, we have a section called Treasure of the Month. And actually, you can find more about this, this rather nice find. You'll see from there that Lord Beveridge was a pretty difficult tenant, to put it mildly. Here is a letter from the, our burst of 1955 to Arthur Goodhart, written just after he had his ear bent by Beveridge yet again. At the end, he writes in despair, both my wife and myself will put in a claim for danger money in view of the hazards incurred when we go to the Staverton garage to collect our car. Poor chap. Well, in October 1958, we then spent £6,950 on purchasing 25 Staverton Road. So there's 104 Woodstock Road, there's 25 Staverton Road. And once again, it was our intention just to lease it commercially. But still, we've got two adjoining properties. Who knows, any more might come up for sale. This area was certainly rather further away from Union than the Banbury Road Triangle, and we just had these existing properties to work with. 
but the site offered opportunities for buying up other properties. And certainly, the North Oxford Gardens had potential for putting new buildings in. Now, let's go back to the Banbury Road Triangle again. Now, yes, lots of nice existing properties there, but, and actually, for a while, the old Parsonage Hotel I know was used for student accommodation. Perhaps some of you lived there. And the overall properties too. But actually, converting all these houses to student use might prove rather fiddly work. And what if it wants to expand northwards? Not so easy. So, just like their counterparts, 600 years ago, the Master and Fellows had a choice about where to create their great annex. In February 1966, our then estate's bursar, Morris Schock, composed a long memorandum on the subject on behalf of the Committee for the Governing Body. As well as the Banbury Road Triangle and the Sabton Road site, Schock also had to consider the St Clements area just over Magdalen Bridge. Oxford City Council had created a grand development plan for the city, which specifically recommended that St Clements be redeveloped for university expansion. All well and good, except that we owed absolutely no property in St Clements. Instead, Schock came down in favour of the Stamton Road site, and he had a great stroke of luck. So we've got, there's 25 Stamton Road, there's 104 back Woodstock Road, 102 Woodstock Road comes up for sale. In November 1965, we agree to buy it, £18,500. Please, all of you, just dream these house prices for North Oxford. <laughs> and in May 1966, we get it. And then stock shock went one further. In the long vacation in 1966, he bought 100A Woodstock Road for £35,000. Now, this act proved a bit controversial. The Finance Committee minutes for the 4th of October 1966 report. There was a discussion about the circumstances in which the purchase had been made, and the committee decided to recommend that the action should be approved. This suggests to me that some fellows weren't wholly happy about the way that Morris Shock had taken things into his own hands during the long back in his eagerness to expand the Stamton Road site. But he had made sure he had now a very nicely expanded site to play with, and we must give him the praise that it is due for that. I find it rather refreshing the act of acquiring land in the 1960s wasn't so very far removed from that in the 14th century. As in the 14th century, a modern deed will start with the names of the parties and describe the property. There will be conditions attached to the same. Now, it's true, the modern conveyance lacks a comprehensive list of witnesses at the bottom, doesn't have all the nice seals of a medieval deed, and, of course, they're not written in Latin anymore. But a medieval conveyancer could, I think, spot how a modern conveyance has evolved in a direct line from the documents which he drafted. You also have noticed the gradual way that we purchased properties in Sabaton Road, and it resembles one very closely the way that our central site gradually grew likewise. In early 1967, UNIV made a firm decision their new annex would be erected on the Sabaton Road site. In July that year, the architect and UNIV old member Philip Dowson was appointed to the project. Meanwhile, in October 1967, the Finance Committee reported the College had agreed to sell 7 to 19 Banbury Road and 14 to 36 Woodstock Road to the University in part exchange for 12 Merton Street and a cash payment of £84,365. And that's why the area north of the Old Parsonage Hotel is now the University's IT centre. So we could begin our plans for the annex. And this, I think, represents Philip Dowson's first thought for Savatonia from May 1968. Even if the precise footprint of the buildings did change as time went on, the basic disposition is already as we know. So there's 
Greenwood Building, there's Bennett, there's Skirlow Building, and there's Percy Building. Um, but there's something else. You've got the sub, you've got the outlines of 25 Stanton Road, 104 Woodstock Road, 100A Woodstock Road. Uh, where's 102 Woodstock Road? We had decided to get rid of 102 Woodstock Road. In the planning application from July 1968, we said to the City Council of that house that the surveyor's report on that house in 1966 estimated its life at only 10 years unless large sums of money were spent on repairs and the college has already spent large sums, has already spent a large amount to maintain it in decent condition, largely on dealing with dry rot. And indeed, 102 Woodstock Road was demolished when building work proper stopped and has vanished from view. I'm not sure I've ever found a photo of it. And in case you're wondering, by the way, 100 Day Woodstock Road may be now more familiar to many of you as Redcliffe Maud House. Now, during all this planning time, don't think our four properties are just being kept unoccupied. They've all been split into flats, and many of them for student use. And if any of you were up here in the late 1960s, you might have known people who lived in those houses, even if you didn't live there themselves. Now, step back and contemplate how daring this plan is. Within the unit itself, we're creating a whole new annex. Also, we'd bought one house with pretty much the express intention of demolishing it. That was a bit new. But what we were doing was very innovative within the context of the university as a whole. We're well used now to colleges having what you might call colonies, like Stavatonia, in different parts of the city. At my other home of Jesus College, we have one colony on the Woodstock Road and a second colony in East Oxford to the north of the Cowley Road. In the 1960s, however, this was all highly unusual. Um, Balliol College had begun to develop the area around Hollowell Manor for postgraduate students, and in 1971, Queen's College would complete the Flory Building just off St Clements. But these were pretty much the only comparable developments. Stavatonia was a remarkably pioneering project for its time. Significantly, though, our ambitions for North Oxford were not quite complete. In 1968, we bought the freehold of 119 Banbury Road and land at the rear of 117 Banbury Road for £52,500, which is all to the east end of the structure there, adjoining our site. However, rather curiously, we seem to have been minded to sell it almost at once, subject to our only keeping an alleyway linking the Sabatonia site with Banbury Road. Instead, we sold the property to developers, and it's now the apartment block known as Factory End. In the light of the great efforts undergone to purchase the Fairfield estate recently, some of us, not least our estate's versa, must slightly regret we didn't hang on to that land. Now, of course, one big difference between the medieval and the modern fellows of UNIV was that our medieval governing body didn't have to deal with planning permission. <laughs> Great University Hall and Ludlow Hall were their own property, do with as they pleased, and that's what they did. By the 1960s, the authorities, perhaps wisely, had grown more cautious about allowing things, such things to go ahead unchecked. And so it was with the Stavatonia project. For this proved controversial, precisely because of its novelty. I said the Oxford City Council had created a development plan which recommended that the St Clement's area be zoned for university use. The same plan had recommended that North Oxford be zoned for residential use. And actually, 104 Woodstock Road had previously been owned by the National Farmers Union, who in 1952 had sought consent to convert some of the building into offices, and permission was refused. So that's why they sold the house to us a year later. Now here were we, trying something much grander. And the Sabatonia project did arouse serious objections. 
Even before we'd unveiled our building plans, some residents had expressed unhappiness about converting our houses into student accommodation. When our intentions for the development of the site were more fully revealed, a Saverton Road residence group was founded to fight the plan. Protests were made at the possible increase of traffic and the ugliness of the buildings. Some more detailed comments included, there is no doubt that students on mass in hostels live at a level of noise and excitement different from that when living with their families. And the effect of this on neighbours is particularly marked in the evening and late at night. <laughs> or, the university has already spoiled parts of North Oxford at the southern end of Banbury Road by demolishing houses and replacing them with science laboratories. <laughs> or, number 102 and 104 Woodstock Road are both among the better houses in the locality, and number 102 should be repaired and used as flats rather than destroyed. They demanded the application be referred to full council so local residents could be consulted. And then, thanks to one resident, the matter went all the way right up to the Ministry of Housing and Local Government, with the result that an inquiry was held in 1968. Unfortunately for us, the inquiry recommended approval. There were some glitches along the way, as there was some controversy about the height of the new buildings. And actually, in March 1970, our original designs for Bennett, Greenwood and Bennett buildings were rejected. But in November 1970, work started. And here, from left to right, there's Lady Redcliffe Maud, Morris Shop, and our then master, Lord Redcliffe Maud, looking on as the first bulldozers get to work. Now, I was happy to wonder whether this house here might be 102 Woodstock Road, the one we got rid of. Um, but of course, now its days were numbered. I'm not going to recount here the agonies of the tale of the erection of Staverton, when a set of buildings, which had been estimated would cost £400,000, in fact cost £1 million, pounds, thanks largely to the effect of 1970s inflation. That's for another day, maybe. But I've shed some light, I hope, on the general story of our land acquisitions, medieval and modern. And now, with UNIV North, we are starting a new chapter in the history of our land acquisition. And one day, it will be time for my successor to tell your successors the story of that one. But I end with one last thought. You'd have realised, as regards the history of our two main sites, our predecessors encountered two great forks in the road. And we know which way they chose. But now, I mischievously invite you to imagine the consequences of having the, chosen the other paths. And so I offer you an alternative view, where here is our main site, and here is our annex. For that could have been our destiny. But as I look at these two sites, I reflect that perhaps our predecessors made the better decision on both counts. Thank you. Now, I think, well, we have a little time for questions if anybody has something they want to throw at me. Ah. So, thank you very much, Ron, for that very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I have particular interest in it because I've been in North Oxford Brisbane uh -huh. for 50 years or so, so I've watched it. <coughs> so, and of course, the latest one which you haven't is in Bambury Road, mm. which is the combination of the town and the student accommodation and the geriatric. Is that right? Yes, yes. Well, I, I've not told the story of Fairfield Road because I feel that sort of that's for another day. And I think kind of this, this is where I kind of hand over to people like William and Sir Ivan to tell you more about that. Um, but no, I mean, it is a never ending story, really. And I think, as, I mean, when you think how so many of you 
I'm sure you had your you had your third years living in digs, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that happens so little now. I think people. It's, it's a much more a thing now to be able for a college to offer its students that you could spend all your time in Oxford living in property owned by the college. And I think we were quite pioneers in achieving that. And I can't deny, when I was applying to uni for the 1980s, one of the several attractions, apart from the fact that reading classics, I get taught by George Corkman, or another attraction was that um, I didn't have to look at digs so all for all my four years. I could live on a co property owned by the college. And I think it's increasingly other colleges are trying to offer this too. In Latin, in English, it became Mickle University Hall. And those of you, of course, who've taken your degrees in person, there's a world of rather strange moment when you're called up as members of Collegium Magnae Aulae Universitatis, which is our Latin name. So, kind of, it's something they've got their head around is did we give our name to the building? Did the building give the name to us? It's what, which it's a, it's a chicken and egg affair, I've never quite got my head on it. One result of what you were saying is that everybody has um, three years or four years in college accommodation is the disappearance of the wonderful old uh, Oxford land lady. Yes, that's very true. I mean, yes. Some of whom were very, very good and some of them weren't. <laughs> <laughs> but can I just ask you about the, the deed, the reaction of the deed that you took over to your colleague at um, Lincoln? Yes. How do you keep these and what conditions are they kept when you have it or them here? Well, just five years ago, we built a perfect good archive store in the college, just under Good Heart Seminar. Um, a deed like that, is, this is normally lives in an tree envelope, in an acid tree box on a shelf. And um, we have a room which is private control. Um, it's not, we don't use air conditioning because, believe me, air conditioning always goes wrong in our house. But we have a system of heaters which is designed to cut into humidity levels down. Because, I mean, basically, humidity is the greatest enemy of our or anything else. So we have a means of keeping the archives at a good, even level of low humidity. <coughs> and we are part of a team, a group of colleges, who employ a team of professional conservatives to advise us on the, on the storage of our records, and they're great help. I have monitors in the archives strong, and I download them and send them off. We always talk about this. So that the... Our room, actually I would say now, we have one of the best archive storerooms of any of the Oxford colleges. And I think it's a great time for centuries without that care. Well, I think these days, I mean, it's, if you keep them dry, you're safe. And I think sometimes one hasn't always, haven't always been kept very dry. Um, but sometimes, I mean, I think these days, I think, I think also our records are better known than they used. But I think it's, it's good that we are taking care of them now. The strange thing is that this sort of stuff is very well made. It's things like 20th century paper, you've got to be terribly careful about. Because I mean, you can't keep, you've got to keep 20th century, 20th century paper in dark places, or the sun will turn it brown. It's a rather strange thing, but this sort of stuff is still a very good myth. What can you tell us about the 17th century reconstruction? Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's, my next, maybe that's my next lecture. Because <laughs> um, it is a, a first degree of activities. There is. Well, in our case, we get, like, maybe I should, actually, it's a prep to talk about it here. We got the most incredible legacy, a platform Simon Bennett, died in 1631, left us an estate in Northampton. It was a clever son. It was a great big wood. And stage one, we chop down the wood, sell it, and build a quadra. Stage two, we turn this denuded land into arable land, rent it out, and that income from that supports new fellows and new scholars. And this brilliant scheme. 
And Simon Bennett gives us that crucial impetus. I mean, sadly, of course, the Civil War rather stops the play. <laughs> uh, perhaps at the risk of publicising myself, there is a certain college history that talks quite a lot more about this. And um, if you have bought a copy, um, <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> I think on that point, we all should be wrong. Very big round of applause for us. It's lovely to have you. So, thank you. Thank you.